Well, I'm excited to get started here this morning with the Word. Um, We're going to talk about this idea of declaring praise to God, praises to the Lord. Psalm 33 is pretty much where we're going to stay the whole morning here. Um, And I just want you guys to know this is my favorite psalm. You're going to find out very quickly when we read the first four verses why it's my favorite psalm. I don't think it'll be... um, Uh, I don't think it'll be too much of a mystery. It'll be fairly obvious. But when I was reading up on praise and this word praise, there's arguably no more practiced and emphasized um, command to the people um, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Praising God is everywhere throughout the Old Testament, and it follows along right in suit into the New Testament. Um, and I love that. Praise is not just, is, is something that you probably don't realize, but you do far more often than you think. And not just praise God, but praise many of other things. Maybe you praise actors for doing a really convincing job in a role in a movie. Or uh, maybe it's a politician. You praise them for voting and standing for upright values or voting on a bill that you believe was, you know, the thing needed to be done. Or maybe it's a musician who plays a song skillfully and you praise them for their skill and um, how well they did. Um, All of these and and many more are examples of praise um, that we give to man. But the thing that I want to talk about today is how much praise are we giving to God each and every day? And Psalm 33 is littered with reasons why and how to pray. If you kind of want to put a Merriam-Webster's definition of uh, praise, it's an expression of approval or com- commendation for something that somebody has done. You're, it's an action. It's something that you do. Um, and there's so much that we have as Christians to be to give praise for, right? Um, especially to God. So as we dive into Psalm 33, I hope that God illuminates to us just a little bit more of how blessed we are, because that's like the majority of this psalm is talking about just how blessed as a nation, as the people of God we are to have God being our guide, but then um, also maybe a little bit more of how we can better um, praise God. So let's start. Psalm 33, starting in verse 1 says, shout, to, shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise benefits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melodies to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. So uh, has it been made obvious yet why I love this passage? <laughs> it's about musicians. It has a lot of talk about musical instruments. Um, which is awesome as somebody who loves playing music, um, who does it every single week. Um, and so I love this passage. Um, but we're going to dive straight in. Verse 1, oh, you righteous. We have the, the stage is set for who this is for, right? This isn't just for actually everybody. This passage is for the people, the righteous of God. Those who stand in upright is what the second half of that These are the people that the psalmist here, um, which I believe is David, is talking to. And and I'll share why I think that it's David a little bit later when we get into that. Um, We could modernly kind of call the upright, the righteous Christians, but even more so Christians walking in that, right? There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who walk in disobedience, who walk in rebellion. But this is, we're talking about straight to the heart. Righteousness is not a title of somebody. It is a attribute of somebody. It is something that somebody carries with them. You don't look at somebody and go, oh, that's righteous Taylor, right? But it's Taylor who might exert righteousness. He might show righteousness. So on the flip side of that, um, how would it look for somebody to praise God who doesn't follow righteousness, right? Imagine taking a class with the world's most renowned professor in whatever field it may be, your favorite science math, whatever, the, just the guy who knows it all, maybe Einstein himself, you're taking a class from Einstein himself, and telling this guy, man, I can't wait to learn from you. You're a genius. You know everything there is to know about this field. Man, this is just so awesome. I can't wait. I'm going to study hard. I'm going to work hard because you know it all, and you just are going to bestow this knowledge on me. And then you never study. You never practice. You fail every test. Kind of makes the praise a little hypocritical, right? 
Wait, wait, you, what, what, if, you, if you believed so much, if you saw this in me, if you wanted to uh, partake in the knowledge and understanding that I have, but never applied it, never really applied yourself to it, doesn't seem like your praise was really in it, right? Exactly. Same with God. We can't come to him with praise and honor and lifting our voices and, oh God, you're so great. And then he looks at our life and people look at our lives and go, you don't live like you praise God. You don't live like you actually see his righteousness. And as we continue on in this chapter, kind of the points that uh, David is going to make or the author is going to make about why we praise God. If we don't believe these points that the author is going to make here, well, yeah, your praise is empty. There's no reason. You're not actually expressing approval and actually listening to this praise. You're just kind of lifting up empty songs. But the, here's the flip side. Here's another cool thing about kind of this verse one through three is there's a physical manifestation of our praise. What is that physical manifestation? Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him, a harp of 10 strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings. So does that mean that praise is only... You can only praise whenever Ted brings his 12 string out or when you come on Sundays for that first 20 minutes of worship, right? No. But here's what I think is happening here. David, then this is why I believe that David wrote this psalm. Um, David is credited with making a fair amount of instruments, but also creating a lot of songs. And I think for David, what he's thinking is, how do I praise God at my best? Well, I've been given music. I'm skillful in music. This is how I praise God. I give back the thing that, I, that he gave me. So I, I would press and, and say that God wants our praises not just in, just in music, but in whatever he's gifted and talented us with. Whatever he's given us, we offer back to him. If it's to make a melody, then it's to make a melody. If it's to teach, then it's to teach. Whatever it may be, we give that back to him. But the posture and the physical manifestation of our praise is important. I would say as important as where our heart is in it, is that we actually physically walk out and do it. Because what do we talk about when we were talking about Colossians 4, 2? Is that a Christian who also stays, uh, you know, the devil will oftentimes scare a Christian into hiding. And they'll say, you know what, that's great. You can have your faith and you can just keep it to yourself. I win if you just keep your faith to yourself because I'll, I'll take all of these other people. But no, we are those who should exuberate praise. People should look at us and see that we always have praise on our lips for our Savior and for what he's done. And praise has a direction, right? It's not to man, it's to God. Praise for everything, everything that we have. I love this quote from Spurgeon. To rejoice in temporal comforts is dangerous. To rejoice in self is foolish. To rejoice in sin is fatal. But to rejoice in God is heavenly. Man, that's just such a good, that's just such a good quote about praise and about what we put our stock in and where we put uh, meaning. When I was talking to a friend uh, the other day about kind of money and like, well, how do rich people deal with this? How do poor people do this? Well, the, the kind of consensus that we came to was, was that, you know, money is not the root of evil. The love of money is the root, right? It's where you put your heart in those things. So it's not bad to have a nice car. The problem is, is if that nice car envelops every waking moment of you and you can't do anything else and ministry, it, you can't minister to anybody because you have that car and you can't do any of these other things that God wants to call you to, you're, you're doing what, what uh, Spurgeon is talking about here. You're rejoicing in the self. <laughs> you're rejoicing in temporal, temporal comforts of, of this world. And it's not of God. A comment in the church. Yes. Uh, starting in verse 2, it says, give thanks. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that just directing to you, I can make, I can say something which is complimentary. Yeah. But it's not really a compliment. Yeah. Or I can say something that I believe that I feel. Same words. Now it's a compliment. Hmm. So we yeah. have to differentiate as we are offering praise to God. Are we just uttering words? Yeah. Or is it actually giving something? Yeah, absolutely. And then we talk about the next part right after that, right? 
sing, verse three, sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the, uh, on the strings with loud shouts. Uh, we're in Psalm 33, just in case you wanted to follow along with us there. So uh, a new song. So that means every Sunday we need to play, uh, the worship team here needs to play the most recent, current radio hit, whatever is popular, whatever is the brand newest of songs. That's what the worship team should play, right? No, obviously that's not what this is talking about. It comes back to what we were, what kind of what Ted was talking about is where's the heart in this? Do you come every week looking to get refreshed by the worship that you bring? We're talking specifically about music here with song. And, but are we coming and singing the same song just because we know the lyrics and great, we know the lyrics, I can zone out and it's just whatever, I'm just gonna sing, um, we win, you know? I'm sure Ted, you, you know that song, vote, at least words wise, pretty close to heart. So it could be really tempting, right? When we do songs, things like that, when we get into kind of that monotony, kind of that uh, routine, and it can become mechanical. And what's he saying? No, 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 don't be mechanical about how you do this. Every time, come with a new heart, refreshed, excited, ready for the Lord to do a work as if it was that first time, right? Have you guys ever had, I know I've had this experience a couple of times, especially with music, where I hear a song and it just like, it hits me right there. Like, man, you just hear it and you're like, oh, the lyrics just speak volumes. They're nor like, normally those songs are very biblically based, you know, and they just, oh, that just, that just pierced right through my heart, right? It's like, man, he wants that every time. He wants us to feel that piercing, feel that brokenness, feel that charge of energy for God every single time that we come to praise him. God's word, the inspired scripture, must be a basis for our righteousness, not our cultural, oh, I skipped over a verse here. Hold on, sorry. Um, here's another uh, quote here. Nevertheless, the most important instrument is the heart. Music, both vocal and instrumental, is imminent use in setting forth the praises of God, but there is no instrument like the rational soul and no melody like that of a well-tuned affections. Man, ain't that, isn't that true? It's not always about being loud, but sometimes, right, we, we tend to say like actions speak louder than words, even though actually, like, then the point is, is that even though actions have no voice, they speak volumes, right? And it's the same way. Sometimes it's not about screaming the lyrics of the song. It's about having ourselves totally sold out for whatever we're praising him for, not holding back in that way. So we continue on into verse four. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his steadfast love. It's full of the steadfast love of the word. God's word, the inspired scripture, must be our basis um, for all righteousness, not our cultural practices, not what our friends think, and not even what we tend to believe is true. Um, oftentimes we can put words into the Bible and say, oh, oh, well, I think that this is what this says. When it's not, it sometimes cannot even be at all what it says. And that's why it's so important to have our practices, our beliefs come from what scripture says about our practices and our beliefs. Um, I think we, I remember back to when the first time I saw the word post-truth come up and I was like, what the heck is the word post-truth? The idea of post-truth is truth is whatever in the moment is true. Whatever for that exact second is true is truth. Like, oh my gosh, that is not the definition of truth whatsoever. <laughs> and people say, at this day and age, we live in what we call a post-truth society. We live in a society that whatever is, I believe is right and okay and truth for right now, that's what truth is. Situational ethics. Exactly. Situational ethics, absolutely. That's not at all what the Bible says about truth, right? And, and I think... It makes us very lazy when we fall into that rut. Oh, well, whenever the new truth comes out, then I'll believe the new truth instead of what we should be doing, which is seeking out truth, looking for truth. Yeah, exactly. We got to keep our minds set on the Lord. Another translation um, says, uh, translation of the second half of that verse says, his work is done in truth. Um, his righteousness, the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. And so um, we need to keep in the righteousness, in the justice. And what is he doing here? He's naming off attributes of God, right? A just God, a righteous God, an upright God, faithful God, right? He's giving his reasons for why he praises. 
which is awesome. I'm watching. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm watching a, a, a show at the moment, and uh, it's a show about New York lawyers. Um, and a fair amount of the time, the plot of, you could kind of boil the plot down to kind of one main storyline. They get charged with something. They get their back pinned up against the wall. And as soon as everybody thinks they're down and out and they're going to get beat, they skirt the law. They do something minorly illegal or totally illegal and get things to swing in their own way, right? God doesn't operate in this way. And it's something that we can praise him for. For God, the ends don't justify the means. Why? Because where the ends and the means come together is where he finds truth. He only works in truth. He only works in righteousness. He only works in justice. He doesn't work in this skirting the truth, skirting in lies, finding loopholes and all this stuff. No, no, no. He works in righteousness and truth. And David's naming these reasons for why God is to be praised. And you got to think about also um, what was music used for in their culture. They wrote songs about things that had happened so that they could retell those things that had happened, tell of the faithfulness of God. So when David is talking about the Lord is just, he's upright, um, he's faithful, full, the whole earth, the, I love the end of that verse five, the earth is full of his stead, the steadfast love of the Lord. He's not just saying that because he thinks that's pretty and says it. No, what's he saying? When I see what God did for my fathers, when I see what God did for their fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers, what do I see? the Lord being faithful, the Lord being just, the Lord being true. He says, man, I praise the Lord because I see that whole line of truth coming all the way back from Abraham. And I see that line and I say, man, I can trust in that and I can store um, my faith in that. Yeah, absolutely. I think and nowadays, a lot of our music has shifted. I don't see that nearly as much in the popular music as, but like when, when music was originally done, that's all music was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what's he saying? He's saying that he's seen God be good in the past. So therefore, he's to be praised for the good here in the future. He's seen God be faithful in the past and he's, and he's praying and praising God that he'll be faithful in the future. And unlike every man that we've ever dealt with, um, every man who has exhibited, uh, well, when we talk about justice and truth and, and peace, those people that we praise for holding those attributes, we're not really actually praising them, right? We're praising the person that they're reflecting. It's Christ, right? And so we continue on in verse six. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by his, the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap and he pulls, puts the deep in storehouses. And David does this in a bunch of other Psalms um, throughout the book of Psalms uh, is that he reminds himself of the absolute power and sovereignty of God, right? The Lord made the heavens by his mouth, all of their hosts, he gathers the sea. And when you go back to that Genesis passage, that Genesis one passage talking about the waters, I mean, it's talking about God tamed these wild waters. And I'm sure we don't think of the, wa the waters as wild as much, right? Because we have navies and we have submarines and we've explored the oceans, right? But for them, I mean, it was do or die out there. If it was a bad storm, you were just sure, you were, I can't do anything about this. I'm just gonna die. Like, this is it. But to say, you know what, all of this, I, I've never seen a man control the waters but I believe, my, like, I believe that God does, right? And that's what Genesis 1 talks about. And he keeps this great perspective of God being able to tame something that, was unta that seemed untamable. Um, and he keeps that perspective in troubled minds and that God, in troubled times and that God created all of those things. You know, I, I think of, you guys have heard this kind of uh, saying, right? The parents will say to their kids, you know, I brought you into this world. I'll take you out of it, right? I can just imagine David looking at God and being like, in troubled times, being like, listen, God, you brought this stuff into this world. You can take this stuff out of this world, right? So I'm going to trust in you. You as almighty God, you as powerful. And that taming of the water, I think is important because it's one of the first major things in Genesis that God did, right? At least when we read the Genesis 1 account. 
um, that he tamed the waters there. And so then we continue into verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. This is a quote. I don't remember if I heard it from somebody or who I heard it from, but I love this. I choose to fear God now so that I don't have to fear him later, right? We think about Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, right? Right? At some point, every single person is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. The question is, is it going to be on bent knee, forced down in that end times? Or now, in humility, in choosing to follow Christ, in choosing to obey him. See, this fear we oftentimes think of like, oh, I'm scared. Which I think in the end time, people are going to be terrified of things. But I think... (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And, but this fear, I think, at least a translation that I've read that I like better is reverence, right? I know what God can do. I've read, just like David is, is rehashing his past, I've seen the past and seen, man, you do not want to mess with him. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood, on and on and on, how he dealt with Israel and judges and in kings and in, right? And all these places, you're like, oh, I do not want to be on that guy's bad side, right? And that was only a, a fraction of what is to come when it, when it comes to judgment and things like that. But there's a reverence for that. It says, God, I know that you can do that, but I, I, I don't fear that in a way of like, you're going to bring that down on me. I fear that in a way of, I, I am so reverent and so in awe of who you are and the power that you hold. And that stands on my side, right? It intercedes on our behalf because we, as Christians, as those who have committed our lives, are committed to Christ, right? And he's on our behalf. Yeah, that Philippians passage is awesome. David continues in expressing his understanding for God's power. Our praise should be rooted in our understanding of who God is, right? And that's, I think, why it's so important that we continue in this process of sanctification. We continue in learning and studying our scripture and all this stuff because our praise grows when we do that. We see things and we go, whoa, I never knew that this was God. Wow. Praise is, is strengthened, right? It grows. How awesome. Glad you guys could join us. We're in Psalm 33 if you want to tag along with us here. We, we're in uh, uh, verse 8 and 9 here. Exactly. Yeah, we did. We actually did. It was it was great, and I think you're absolutely right. It plays right in to what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Sydney, that's a great question, and off the top of my head, I do not know. Uh, I would have to look into it. <laughs> I can't, I can't off the top of my head give you an example or, or if I, I know, but um, that is something I will definitely look into and get back to you on. Yeah, <laughs> enough. Yeah, we already got that one out of the way, right? <laughs> But here's the flip side of this. David's not expressing his understanding from God's power because he knows it completely, right? He's not saying, I know everything about God's power, therefore I'm praising him. He's saying, what I do know about God's power, I'm going to praise him for. I don't even think that David believed that he could ever fully understand it on this side of heaven, but it doesn't mean that he's not to be praised for it. And that's something that I think, especially in our culture, we have so backwards is this idea that 
well, I won't do anything until I know for certain 100% that it is completely 100% and I gotta understand it 100% to be truth before I'll ever put any stock or any faith in this, right? But that's not how the Bible works, right? God says he rewards faith, right? He wants us to look and take that step. I love in Psalm 119 talking about um, God's word is a lamp onto my feet. Think about putting a lamp on your feet. Does that, if we were to turn all the lights off in here and we were to put a lamp on our feet, wanna, like just a little light, would it illuminate this whole room and we'd be able to see everything and know everything that was happening or everything? No. A lamp onto your feet, probably maybe two, like max, you can see two feet in front of you, maybe, right? But he's asking us to take steps with that lamp on our feet and continue walking in faith and all that. Not... Let me give you the whole plan. Let me tell you everything that's gonna happen in your life and understand all of it and then you can walk in it. No, no, no. Take the step now. Take the step of faith here and in baby steps, he reveals those things. Don't use a flashlight, <laughs> use a flashlight right? But there's another cool thing that he's pointing out here. All God has to do is speak. Right? We do a lot of talking. I'm standing up here and I'll talk for another 30 minutes, Right? But nothing's going to be created into existence from any of the words that I stand up here and say, right? But God breathed life in Genesis, right? He spoke things into existence. If that doesn't talk about how much power he has, my goodness, I don't know what does. That's incredible. Something that we do every single day with tons of people that never created anything. In fact, in a lot of cases, it tends to destroy a lot of things, right? <laughs> God does and can breathe life into things and create things and direct people's paths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the centurion pleaded to him, yeah. And he said, go home for they're healed, you know, which is awesome. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, you did. <laughs> yep. Israel yeah. So we continue into verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Man, how often do we get worked up about other people's plans, right? Especially the ones that tend to thwart our plans, right? No, 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 you can't do that because I want to. No, 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 right? We get so worked up. And what is, God, what is David praising God for here? There's not a plan that man can make that thwarts what God can do. In fact, it's actually the opposite, is that man makes his plans and God says, that's cute, <laughs> And he takes the, the most awful and terrible man-made plans, and what does he do? He turns them for love and righteousness and goodness. Now, I'm not saying people don't get hurt. He doesn't somehow turn these plans, and all of a sudden, never, you know, he didn't take the terrible act of which was 9-11, and everybody was saved, and oh my goodness, how beautiful. No, people still died in that. But how many testimonies do you guys know of, of people who out of 9-11 were like, there has to be something more than this? God has to be real. There has to, I, I, I cannot, um, Jeremy has shared it publicly, so I don't mind putting him on a spot on that, even though he's not here. He's one of those people, and his testimony is, 9-11 was my last straw. When I saw those Twin Towers come down, I knew God was real, and I had, to, I had to repent. I had to make the change. God makes those plans uh, turn for his good. Yeah. Um, to the point of, you Yeah, absolutely.
their book is torture. Wow. Now, I mean to hear that they did look at torture. Mm-hmm. Because they're actually just as they're in there looking for a shirt. And I said, look, I don't even know how I got your socks on, but it just came out. <laughs> See, yeah, absolutely, the work of God, right? And that goes right back to that verse, verse one and two, what we're talking about, right? When you shout the praises of the Lord, you don't hide that. People are gonna see that and go, man, that's awesome. I I want a piece of that. I want what she's got. I want that kind of joy in the time of struggling and of strife, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that when I used to be, I used to get discouraged that I did not know that he stole. Yeah. So when I reach out. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, how come I don't know what happened? But the thing is, it's not for me to know. But, you know, if the Lord wants me to know, he'll share it with me. And if, when I get to heaven, if he wants me to know, he'll, I'll get to teach him those people. Yeah. I'll say, hi, I remember you. <laughs> yeah. So again, we tend to get so worked up over the plans of other people. Oh my gosh, if they do this, how is God going to prevail? If they do this, how can any good come from this? But what did we just read in verse 11? The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. There's not a plan that thwarts what God is going to do. There's not a plan. There's not a person who can come on this earth. There's not a thing that can happen in here that God's going to go, well, that surprised me. Didn't see that coming. (laughs) Now my plans are ruined. 33, Psalm 33. One thing that makes the light of God all more obvious is the darkness of this world. Yeah. When people see that darkness, they get depressed and hopeless. Mm-hmm. They're like, wait a minute. There is something else. Mm-hmm. They see an alternative yeah. to that darkness. That's how this church got started on the beach. <laughs> yeah. Calvary Chapel, yeah, absolutely. No man's actions can surprise or change what God's plan is. And so we have to rely as Christians on God to carry out his task, right? Just appealing to him, like, God, you're good. Your counsel stands forever. I, I have trust and I praise you and have faith that you're gonna carry out your task at hand and that as long as I keep the lamps on my feet <laughs> and keep walking in faith, that nothing that can happen to me is out of the will of you. Now, the problem is we tend to get self-focused. We tend to get focused on what we want, what we think we need, and start doing things apart from God. And then we go, God, why didn't you, why didn't you approve this thing? Why didn't this happen? Why This looks good. And he's like, that's because you're way over there, and I'm walking this line. <laughs> and we got to reel ourselves back in. Again, why we got to keep ourselves centered and praise and keep ourselves within that will. In the song, we, we sang, we win, it's we. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so we continue into verse 13. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of all of them and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his strength. The war horse is false hope for salvation and by it great might it cannot rescue by its great might it cannot rescue I don't understand the horse is the same thing as salvation well we're going to get there let's start oh, okay. let's start in verse 13 and we'll work our way down there okay. god made each and every one of us each with our own particular physical mental and emotional makeups including the allowance of our weaknesses and sinful inclinations also as his maker he has the right of inspection and he considers all of our works. We are his children, his children of God, those who have been brought into his fold. Um, and he fashioned each and every one of us, and then he looks upon what we're doing, right? He says, I know the, how I created you. I know what I put in you, and I know what I left out of you. And we often, what do we all say? God, you just don't understand what I'm dealing with, right? No, I, I understand. And I'm asking you for a little bit of faith, <laughs> Right? If you guys were here Sunday, um, what Merv was talking about, right, was taking that faith and growing it into perseverance and to um, self-control and all those fruits of the spirits that we talk about, right? Because God wants to take us from... Who was in here, the bottom looks like a pyramid yeah. of sorts of blocks. At the bottom is faith. 
Mm-hmm. And faith can't build it. Mm-hmm. But as it went up to the very top, it was love. Yep. It was really, it was really. I, what can yep. I say? I'm not easily impressed, but I was yep. impressed. <laughs> So he fashions all of our deeds. Now let's talk about verse 16 and 17 about this. King is not saved. Armies, what warriors, what are we talking about here? I thought we were praising God. What are we talking about here, right? Um, well, if you look at history, there have been many wars, especially biblically, if you go back to that Old Testament, many wars that were fought where the people of God were significantly outnumbered, right? And you can think of many, many of them where man would say, there's no way Israel goes into this battle and wins. There are many times when you think about the split of, of, of the kingdom into Judah and um, the north and the south. I can't remember what they called the south. Judea and Jerusalem? Yes, correct. Thank you, guys. Israel and um, Judah. There was plenty of times where they looked at that split and said, well, I need to make alliances with my north because I'm going to get killed from the south. Oh, I need to make alliances with the east because the south is going to come after me, Right. We don't have the army. That's not how God looks at it. 16, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not deceived by his great strength. He's referring back to that verse 10, right? The counsel of the Lord stands forever. Not the counsel of the Lord stands when the army is less than 500 people. Not the counsel of the Lord stands when the king is less than $1 million rich, right? <laughs> No, forever. There's not a king, there's not an army that can thwart the plans. And no matter how strengthened they are, no matter how much might they have, never stop, right? Even when they're outnumbered. God brings the victory. And even in the affairs of other kingdoms who fight other kingdoms, maybe not even Israel, God still allows whoever's to win to win. <laughs> he doesn't all of a sudden just say, oh, those are two pagan communities, those are two begging countries, they'll just figure it out. No, he says, no, I, I have a plan for every single one of these people. And so this is how this orchestrates out. Think about Goliath. With all that strength, Israel cowered believing that this man was going to be the doom of them. They, we are done. All that strength. Yeah. But he couldn't thwart the plans of God. Why? Because David, little man of faith, no pun intended, but literally little man of faith <laughs> came and said, you know what? God brings the victory. Yeah, we get so terrified over governments and other countries and other rulers, people who we think have this authority over us. Maybe it's your boss. I can thankfully say that I know that my boss fears the Lord, and so I'm not <laughs> terrified of him. <laughs> but especially in the secular realm, we can get so caught up in, oh man, my boss is gonna do, what if he does this? What, oh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get, right? And we go back to I, I, I. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my job. If I stand up for virtue, oh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. No, I can't, I can't stand up for God in my workplace. I'll lose my job. Well, maybe it's better that way. <laughs> maybe you do need to, and God's calling you to that greater faith, right? No strength of man, no powerful CEO, no manager of a Walmart can thwart the plans of God. That's what I'm trying to get at. And David is harping on this because it's where his praise is centralized is in the authority and in the strength of God. He says, I praise you, Lord, because you bring the victory, because you bring the honor, you bring the righteousness to people, and goodness comes from you. When we're talking about the war horses, um, it kind of refers to the technology of the time. You see, uh, in battle, I kind of have a, it's a hard depiction, but horses was like the technological advancement of the day. Like if you had horses for your army, that was, you, you won wars. You won wars because you had horses, right? And, and what's David saying here? He's saying the war ho horse is false hope. You think, man, my army is so strong because we have horses, and it's a false sense of security. No, the security is in knowing that God is on your side. The horse does not rescue you. Might does not rescue you. Um, so the strength of the horse, that's where that comes from. It's false hope when pinned up against God. If we think that we can somehow get one over on God, if we think we can overtake him, overcome him, do whatever we think to thwart his plans because we have something that he doesn't, false hope, false salvation. 
And technology in our society is a huge issue, right? But here's the flip side of that. The war, what was it saying here? The war horse is a false hope for salvation. It's not saying that the war horse isn't mighty. It's not saying that there isn't strength in a, good, in a, in a strong army. What it's saying is, is when you pin it up against God, that's where you lose. <laughs> Today, we have tons of technology. And I know a lot of people who want to crucify cell phones and, and all this technology. But here's the thing, the technology is not the problem. It's what we're using them for. It's what we're using them for. You see, because God has connected, take Haiti, our our mission field in Haiti, right? If it wasn't for technology, we would have no way of sending them money, or it would be a far, it would be far more difficult, I should say, to send them money. I know that Heather and Jeremy and Lori communicate daily with those who are taking over there, who are working over there, right? Right? Well, that's, technology's not evil for that, right? The fact that I have a pocket Bible that I can whip out, and when somebody asks me to Starbucks, when I see, well, maybe when I see somebody in Starbucks, I can go, you know, I don't have my Bible right on me, but I do have this pocket Bible, right? I don't have a physical copy of my Bible, but I do have this, right? It's not the technology that's evil. It's that we choose to pin it up against God. We choose to let it run our temptations amok and run all that. And now I'm not saying everybody get a phone because you need to have a pocket Bible. Everybody get the newest technology. No, no, no. We need to know our limits and know where it does become too much of a distraction or it does become too much of a temptation for us, right? Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> that's another subject maybe we can find some verses to back that one up but we'll see Yeah. And we get out of the house without even watching. Mm-hmm. And, and some of that is because we're using our technology. It's become important enough. We, but some of it I have to because I'm taking care of so many different kinds of business with health issues. You know, you know we had that flat tire. Mm-hmm. So we're stopping for tires. So, but it's like, okay, so but what do you put as priority? Mm-hmm. You put as priority, then you make time for what is important to you the most. Absolutely. Verse 18, behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, right? We just had that hope, right? That false sense of hope in the war horses, but what are we talking about here? No, 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 the Lord's eyes are on those who hope in him, in his steadfast love. And then verse 19, that he may deliver their souls from death and keep them alive in famine. All the way back to 13, right? Talking about, that the steadfast love of the Lord, what we hope in, the strength that we put, it should be in Christ because he's the one who delivers the soul from death. He's the one who delivers people from famine, right? And I love this, and I think that what David is getting at is a reason to praise God is because he does meddle in the affairs of man. You know, there's a whole belief out there called deism that believes God spun the earth like a dreidel, like a top and walked away and was like, all right, let's see what happens when I come back in <laughs> however long, right? But what was David saying here? No, 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 he, he meddles in the affairs of man. He deals with people. He works on their behalf. He is the salvation that keeps people from famine. How do you spell deist? D-E-I-S-T. Oh, it's D-E-I, uh, deist is D-E-I-S-T. Deism is D-E-I. S E S M, yeah, D E, yeah, D I E S M, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Th- think about this Matthew 10 uh, passage right here. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? Man, that is, that is profound. That is deep. If God cares about the smallest of birds, a sparrow, 
How much more does he care about the people that he created and spoke breath into? Because he created the birds too, right? But he spoke breath. He gave his, um, he gave his life into us. Exactly. In his image, that's 128. When we fix our eyes on God, on his faithfulness, on his love, there's no reason to worry about the things of this world. That's why declare his praises. That's why that's the title of this, why we came to this. Because when we envelop ourselves in the praise of God, we can't worry. There's no time to worry about anything else. There's no time to worry about who's trying to thwart the plans of God. Why? God's going to deal with it. I'm just walking with him. We have a part to play in it, yes, but it's not to worry. It's not to be quarrelsome. It's to focus in on him. When we focus in on him, God orchestrates the rest. What we need to do is walk in his will and give him praise when he carries out the task, right? One of the really hard things about being in leadership in a church, being on staff, being in any kind of place where you stand up here on the platform and people look at you is there's such a temptation to take the praise for yourself, right? How often do you guys watch the person who takes the trash out every, I mean, how many of you guys can name the person that takes the trash out every Sunday? And how many times do you guys praise him for him or her for what, when they do that, right? It's easy when they stand up here and they're doing their thing from up here. When you're not getting, when you're not getting the front. But the, my point with that being is for people who stand up on these platforms, they, have the, they need the most guidance, the most focus on Christ because it's so easy from that platform to take it for yourself. And it's even easy to take a little bit. And God's like, no, 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 you don't get any of that. You remember where you were, Ephesians 2, right? You were a son of disobedience. You walked in iniquity. The only reason you can even be a part of this plan is because I've given you the right. I've given you that ability, Right? Sure. But yeah. We don't remember to think that, uh, sometimes if you take enough trash, I <laughs> Not me. Verse 20. <laughs> our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Steadfast love. That's three times now he's referenced steadfast love. You think that's important? And love is cool. We talk about love a lot, but there's something to be said about steadfast love, right? Um, How do you define steadfast love? Without steadfast, without change. It's always there. Unconditional. Yep, Absolutely. You know, I love wings, especially Wingstop wings. But when they changed their order, I, or when they changed their, um, what do you call it, their recipe, I did not love Wingstop wings anymore, <laughs> right? That's not steadfast love. Steadfast love is, I loved you when you were your dirtiest. I love you now as you're a baby Christian, and I'll love you forever as you mature in me, right? Steadfast. Oh, even Jack, yeah, when dad gets, when it's 2 a.m. and dad's like, I don't know, kid. And then you go, nope, I, I still love you. Steadfast. Steadfast is my love for that boy. Absolutely. And so our soul waits on the Lord. David took all this time, looked at God from a ton of different angles, all of these attributes, all of his faithfulness as our helper, as the divine creator, as the ruler of the world, as the man in charge for setting up and setting things in motion and also stopping things as the caretaker of his children, and he ends it now, that we must be content in our innermost self, our soul, that the Lord fights our battles and helps us with this thing we call life, right? He doesn't say, my soul, now that I understand, I'm gonna go out and fight all these battles. No, no, no. I, I, I praise you, God, for who you are, and now guess what? I'm waiting on you. I want to know where you want to move. I want to take steps where you take steps. I want to talk to the people that you want to talk to. And it's at that support and care for ourselves that we find joy and peace. Because remember, what have we talked about this whole time? He's trustworthy. He's steadfast. He's faithful. It's where our joy and our peace comes from, 
right? And then we go all the way back, full circle to the beginning, sing to the Lord a new song. Every time we come with praise to him, we can remember his love and what he did for us even this morning, right? The ability that we got up this morning should refresh us this morning for his praise. Barely, Barely is still, <laughs> still here <laughs> because he is trustworthy. And so he ends the psalm with a prayer that God refreshes us as we put our trust in him, right? Be upon us even as we hope in you, right? We have such busy schedules, right? Our technology has gifted us with the ability to do more with just the same amount of time as we used to have. Yesterday, yeah, yeah, yesterday, I have to admit something to you guys. I was almost too busy yesterday to meet with somebody who needed guidance on pursuing a relationship with God. But the Lord convicted me. The Lord convicted me hard and said, no, what, what are you doing? This is the work I've called you to. Yeah, I know you want to do this, that, and the other, but you're walking this way right now, and I need you to go this way for their sake, right? Oh, I, <laughs> yeah, he slapped me over there with a two-by-four about it, you know? <laughs> I was like, no way, God, I'm not, I'm not missing this opportunity to follow in your will, Right? But we can oftentimes, I know that that's only one time in a many multitude that I haven't, that I haven't listened to that voice and and gone with the will, right? And so what are we doing? We pray that the Lord be upon us as we hope in him. As we hope for that future, as we walk in that path, Lord, would you in your Holy Spirit dwell in us and speak to us, right? It's time that we stop letting our schedules dictate our relationship with God and let God dictate our schedules, I hear it so many times from so many people. Oh, I can't serve because, no, 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 no. Oh, I can't because of, no, 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 no. Guess what? That's an excuse. <laughs> That's an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. But I talked to Dwayne about it. He said, there's other things to do. Absolutely. There's always. Everybody has an opportunity. But the thing is, is that we get so enveloped in our own schedules sometimes. And now, I'm not saying that over anybody in here. You have to take for yourself and your heart, check yourself and say, is that me? Do I let my schedule dictate my relationship with God or do I let God dictate my schedule, right? And there are often some really cool things that we get to do in this world. There's some really entertaining and fun things that you can do. The thing is, is that we often think that the entertaining and fun things are where God is. And I would beg to differ. You look at how Paul lived. I don't think there was anything entertaining and fun about being in prison all the time, anything entertaining and fun about being stoned, anything. But what what does he say, right? I'm a servant in chains, right? I'm a slave to this gospel and I don't care what's happening to me. I don't care what I'm doing as long as I'm pursuing that relationship with Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that story, right? Paul and Silas in prison. By man's authority, by man's might, that's a hopeless situation. And I guarantee you there were prisoners there who were thinking, what are these maniacs doing? Don't they realize they're in prison, chained with a gate and a guard? There's nothing to praise about. And God said, yeah, that's the plan of man, and that's cute. (laughs) Here's what I have. (laughs) Thank you guys for being faithful. Here's what I have. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was Punishment. Prison. Losing prisoners, yep. Losing prisoners, you take your place or you die. Yep. And that's, all of that didn't happen yeah. There's also a second half of this praise. So praise because, because uh, well, we praise God because of his steadfast love, all those things. But there's a second half of this. We, we need to be Christians who put 
reverence and fear back on the name of God. There's a new Netflix show out right now that has portrayed Jesus as a homosexual. Hmm. I, I saw yeah. the promo for that. Yeah. Um, I don't get Netflix, but because of some other things that come up and stuff. Yeah. And I saw, I saw, yeah. I didn't know that that's what it was. Yeah. Because I didn't stay on it long enough, but now. There is no fear and reverence in that show for who God is and what he has done, right? <laughs> yeah. If people have the audacity to pursue some kind of movie mm-hmm. on Netflix or any other venue. Yeah. We need to be Christians who stand for revering God for who he is and the power that he has. David, this whole psalm was about the power of God, right? Praising God for his power, his might, to thwart enemies' plans, to overtake mighty armies to create the world, to tame wild waters, right? And fear, not fear because, oh my gosh, he's gonna smite me. Fear because, Lord, you are holy. I can't even see your holiness without death. I can't even be in your presence un- unhinged, un- just un- um, uncensored, unfiltered, without it completely tearing me to shreds, Right? We need to remember that he's the one who set all of this in motion and is in this world. He's not absent from this. He's not just watching us flounder around like fish out of water. No, he's in this world and he's fighting on our behalf. David praises him and that's what encourages him to sing that new song every day. Not knew that it was written in 2019, knew that it refreshes his soul every time he sings it. A lot of the songs that you guys, you guys, totally get this. We talk about this all the time. A lot of the songs that Ted does are not from my, <laughs> my generation. They're from his, right? But they refresh me nonetheless, right? I won't speak for him about songs from mine, but I will speak on, on what mine are. But I know that every time I hear them, though they weren't first time songs and they were written far before me, but yet still to this day and age, right? They fill me with joy and peace and gladness and speak truth to my life and my walk with Christ, right? That's what David's talking about here. Not a song, not that our lives reflect just doing a new thing every day, but that our lives reflect a daily refreshing, a daily anointing of Christ's spirit on our lives and that we go out and we do his work and praise him for doing a work through us, right? That we even get to stand here and get to do that. Yeah. I go all the way back to those old time bands. Yeah. Onward Christian Soldiers is my favorite on the old rugged cross. I mean, it's my generation goes way back. And it would be wonderful if you could incorporate now how great they are. And what is the one that's in old time? The Blues Bat. It goes all the way back. What are we singing all the time? Amazing Grace. Yeah. So some of it crossed over. Yeah. Which is awesome. I don't know how many people in here are seven or something. <laughs> so back to the beginning, my encouragement to you guys, we praise a lot of things in this world. We praise actors and musicians, maybe politicians, depending on how you feel, <laughs> depending on what they're doing. But we praise a lot of things. We praise Whataburger for having good burgers, right? <laughs> Whatever it may be. We need to be committed, people committed to the praises of our God, to the strength and the might that he does in us, praising him for everything that we're doing, for the breath that we have, for the food that we have on our table, for the ability to come to a church like this and not be an underground, right? All these things are things to sing praises to. And I encourage you as the worship leader to lift your voices in it. <laughs> um, I, I love when uh, we, we had this worship night, um, a Sunday night, at, Ros- at Rosalind, and uh, we don't run. Here I run headphones so that I can hear everything, but we don't run them there. And it's just such a blessing to get to do that because I hear the praises of the people, right? 
I love these songs. I pick the songs. Of course I love them. <laughs> but when I hear other people joining in that love and refreshment and joy of what these, the truth of these lyrics are that we sing on those opportunities, it just, it fills me. It just, oh, what a joy it is to get to do those things. And this last time we had people who don't even go to this church there who came and said that they were refreshed by it. And man, what a joy that is. Glory to be to God for those opportunities and things like that, right? Declare his praises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I praise you so much for what you have done in the lives of everybody in this room, Lord. Bringing them here, bringing them to faith and an understanding of who you are. Not an understanding that says I know every single thing about God and therefore I believe, but an understanding that says, Lord, what I do know is that you are good and you are faithful and you are loving and you work in our lives. And Lord, would that be enough that every second of our day we'd praise you for it? No enemy can thwart the plans of you, Lord. Your counsel reigns supreme and reigns forever. Would we focus our attention and fix our eyes on you, knowing that you're the author and the perfecter of our faith, knowing that maturity in you is knowing more and more about you and putting more and more faith in you for each and every step that we take, Lord. And would praise be on our lips that others would see it, others would hear it, and they'd ask, like Sharon was, like Sharon was sharing, Lord, that they would ask and we'd tell. We'd be able to share the joy of the Lord with those around us. Keep us safe as we go from this place. And Lord, I pray for this evening as um, many will be intoxicated and choosing to drive and being out in dangerous conditions. Lord, keep everybody safe, Lord. Bring them home to their families, Lord. And that you just do a work in this new year. We praise you and thank you for keeping us here for just a little bit longer. In Jesus' name, amen.